auspicious greetings. I'm Jue Wei with the Humanistic Buddhism Center here in the Nantian Institute. To everyone who is online, happy Vesak week. This is the time when Buddhists from all around the world are commemorating the birth, the enlightenment, and the nirvana of the Buddha. And indeed, it is very auspicious that during this week, we are conducting the second episode of the COVID-19 detox webinar series on the topic of helping from home. First, please allow me to say just a few words um, about a question that I'm often asked. Why is this webinar series called a detox series? Well, I thought of the term detox because I feel that many doctors, the government, they are all helping to detox our bodies as well as the environment that we work in of a tiny virus and a whole battalion of them that's invisible to our naked eyes. While they take care of the external environment, I think it's in our interest to take care of our minds, what's inside of us. And so for this purpose, I thought that the COVID-19 pandemic really gives us all a time to pause and examine if we have any invisible toxins remaining in our minds and to find ways to, to detoxify our views, our attitudes and our values. So to help us do so, we have invited several thoughtful and wise people to offer humanistic Buddhist responses to this modern crisis we're experiencing right now. In our opening episode last Saturday, Roshi Dr. Susan Murphy helped us to explore how taking shelter in place and mindfully not touching our face can lead us to be more aware of our place in this highly interdependent natural world. We are going to follow on in this second episode by inviting Gawain Powell Davis, the chair of the Buddhist Council of New South Wales, to speak to us about the concept of helping. Prior to his current position, Gawain was associate professor and director of the Centre for Primary Health Care and equity at the University of New South Wales, where he worked for 20 years in research development and evaluation of primary health care. And over the past few months, I've had the privilege of working under the leadership of Gawain in the Buddhist Council of New South Wales. And Gawain has also helped us here in Nantian Institute as our advisor. And hence, the affinities were created for today's meeting. So today we will explore what is it that people need and what we can offer during this global epidemic. We will cover three main points. The first, solidarity in hard times. Second, recognizing when and how to help. And third, what does helping others teach us about ourselves and who we really are. And I'm sure that you are here participating in this particular webinar because you embody the Bodhisattva spirit to want to help. If you have any questions throughout this webinar, please feel free to simply turn, write your questions down in your um, chat. So at the bottom of the Zoom screen, you will see a little chat window just feel free to write it in there and we will try to address your question throughout this webinar. So I have the pleasure now to introduce to you Gawain Powell Davis. Good morning, Gawain. Good morning and, and thank you for having me. How are you feeling today? Very well, very well. Yep, ready Good. for it. <laughs> Good, Gawain. We I want to thank you first for recording a podcast prior to this um, webinar so that our audience member has an opportunity to 
hear about what it means to help from home. And in there, you said that your new favorite term is called solidarity. So what does solidarity mean for humanity during a global crisis like this one that we're experiencing? For me, the phrase that sums up solidarity is <clears throat> we're in this together. Um, there are forms of helping like the uh, Victorian lady who delicately hands out something to the beggar in the street, which have no solidarity at all. They're not in anything together. This is from me up here to you down there. Solidarity, we're in this together. For the purposes of this epidemic, there's no difference between me and you. And what is going to help me is going to help you. And what is going to help you is going to help me. So we depend upon each other. So that's it. It's that recognition that we're in this together. And if we acknowledge that and work together, then we can get somewhere. Indeed, it is about us working together. So does solidarity require a struggle? How does helping and suffering interrelate? Well, I think um, human beings are very good at dividing themselves off into little groups. You know, the job they have, the suburb they live in, the country they, they are part of, which kind of football they care about. And all of those things create little pockets of solidarity, but they're set against each other. And what a big global problem like the pandemic does is it puts us all in one group um, so that we have something in common with people in Central Australia that normally we never would have. So it's the recognition, I think, that um, it's a problem for all of us and it's a problem which really matters. It's not a kind of nice thing about should we change this policy or that. It's are we going to get through this with ourselves and our loved ones still alive and that's serious. So what the suffering does, the sense of danger, the sense that we need to be looking out for ourselves and each other is it says this is serious. So we don't indulge those little ticks of the mind which want to say, ah yes, but you're a bit different, or I'm not quite the same as she is, and, and all of those kind of things which so quickly come up and get in the way of being in this together. I know it does, doesn't it? We seem to have this ingrained need to establish our own personal identity, our in-group, and as a result, we say we only care either just for ourselves or within our group. And now with this pandemic, in fact, it means that we have to step outside that circle because just myself or just my little group is not going to do it. We need all of us. I think that's true. I think you see it in um, every now and again, people seem to suggest that maybe we could have over 70s shut up at home and let everybody else go and roam the streets and enjoy themselves and earn money. Now, that's introducing such a huge divide between yeah. them and us and however much we care about the people on the other side of the divide we will never be able to work together on this problem mm. if we put ourselves in those two camps That's so cool. it's so solidarity also means sacrifice sometimes it means because of your need i am willing to forego the chance to go back to work or whatever else it might be um, because again, I recognize we're in this together and you may be young, but you've got a granny too and she's over 70. So That's we've all got very complex stakes in this. That is so correct. Last week, we talked about compassionate isolation. Mm. Yeah. For example, right now during the lockdown, we have to work from home, we have to stay at home, unless we have to go out for essential services some people may start feeling very uneasy at home. But if we consider this as compassionate isolation, it's really a gesture of compassion to keep ourselves at home and not add burden to others. So I think that's true. There's a sense in which, for myself, I can agree to take on a risk. You know, it's okay, it's not too dangerous, I'll do it. The thing that brings you up short is when you realize you're putting that risk on other people too. 
And what you don't have a right to do is give other people a risk. That's their choice. So again, in it together, um, I don't make decisions for your risk. I, I support you in what you are doing. And that's my job as another person who is trying to get us collectively through this. As a long time um, practicing Buddhist, Garland, do you find that um, this period of pandemic also helps you to reflect on the Buddhist concept of interdependence? Look, absolutely. Um, and I suppose one way I experience it is that the sense of I am doing this for you starts to get a bit blurred and it's as it were I'm doing this because this is a good thing to do right. and I'm much less clear I think about what it's costing me and what it's benefiting other people or, or vice versa there's just a sense that this is the flow of energy this is the flow of caring that's going on and that is actually the thing that's rewarding what yeah. is rewarding is the flow from me to you and back again which says not in the head but in the heart we are in this together and to the extent that we are in this together, we are one. And well, that's a very, very, very powerful feeling. Well, um, Damon, this, this really power of, of we are one. I want to share with you something that um, we've done, I think thanks to your leadership here at the Buddhist Council of New South Wales, we've worked together with the Federation of Australian Buddhist Councils, as well as the various Buddhist councils across Australia and the Australian Sangha Association to run this Ibeisak event. When we thought about it six weeks ago, what crossed my mind was this is mission impossible. Mm -hmm. We've done Buddha's birthday celebrations a lot here at Nantian and it takes about nine to 12 months of planning and a lot of um, like almost a thousand volunteers coming together. Yet at the same time, we say six weeks, that's all we've got. And we're going interstate. We want to bring in all traditions. We want performances, prayers, blessings. How could we do it? But at that time, I think all of us in the organizing committee just says, this is an opportunity for solidarity. If not now, then when? This is the first time, at least for us, that we could bring together Buddhist Buddhists from across all traditions from around Australia to come commemorate the same event. For us to share our practice and our prayers and blessings to all in Australia, in New Zealand and across the world. So we have to do it. I think, I think that sense of mission was what made it possible for us. So I want to say thank you very much, Gawain, for giving us this opportunity. And I'd like to say on that, that um... I mean, this arose out of a meeting that we convened as the Buddhist Council, but very quickly a lot of other people came in. And I have to be honest that there were moments early on, there was a little part of me which said, got to make sure the Buddhist Council gets proper credit. Um, and very quickly those faded away. And they faded away because what happened was the stream of energy and activity between the different people came together and became a kind of torrent. And it wasn't just you couldn't say which bit was the Buddhist council and which bit was other people. It was actually a waste of time. It would be like looking at a river and saying, well, I like the water on the other side, but not the water on this side. I mean, that's silly. You enjoy the river as a whole. Okay. And um, so for me, that was a real learning to see that mm. inside me there was that niggle. I wanted to hold on and say, hang on a sec, this is Buddhist council stuff. But actually to see that that had to go. And when okay. it went, I felt much better about it. The same here, Gawain. I, have, I wear two hats, the Buddhist Council and Nantian Institute. And I want to say all these uh, institutions being represented. But after a while, I realized, no, it's actually all of us as humans. We are in yes. it together, um, wherever, we, oh, whatever our background is. And so I would like to welcome everybody online. If you have an opportunity, tomorrow is the day when everything comes together at 4 o'clock please go on to the Federation of Australian Buddhist Council website and join us live. So Gawain, let's move on. In the podcast, you mentioned that in our attempt to help others, we tend to take over. 
Now, this is really something that we trying to be um, bodhisattvas have to watch. That you know, we seem to feel so confident that we have the answer to rescue. So how can we move beyond this rescuing mentality and move into a space that will be truly helpful? I think there's a couple of things that can make it easy for us to become a rescuer. Um, the notion of being a rescuer is, I see that you've got a problem and I think, hey, I can fix your problem for you. Won't that be great? And I fix your problem for you. And lo and behold, I'm not given the thanks that I want because maybe that's not what you wanted or maybe you wanted to do it yourself or maybe you wanted it done differently. So um, I think there's a couple of things that come in there. One is that um, one of the things that um, encourages to rescue is if instead of seeing you as someone who's got a bit of a difficulty, I see you as someone with a problem. Mm. When you've got a problem, you put it in a box and you look at it and it's not part of that other person anymore and it's not part of you and you can put your laser-like attention on it and you can fix it. And of course, for the person whose problem is being solved, it feels as if they've lost ownership. It's not theirs anymore. It's not their life that's been improved. So part of it is that seeing things as problems can be very unhelpful. The second thing is that it, who does it belong to? It belongs to the other person. And they know what it is that they want to change. And they probably have a fairly good idea of the role that they would like to have in it. Someone coming in and taking over, which is what rescuers do, leave them at the end, perhaps with their problem beautifully solved, but they no longer own it, it's no longer part of their life. So where do they go for that from there? And they haven't been strengthened in the long term. It, it's like that old thing about you um, give someone a fish and you feed them for a day, you teach them to fish and you feed them for life. What you're wanting to do with helping someone is feed them at least for the rest of that day. And that feeding comes not from, I had a problem and it's fixed. That feeding comes from, this person thought I was worthwhile to stop and spend some time with. This person saw me. This person recognized my strengths as well as my difficulties. And this person, solidarity again, was in there with me. They weren't standing on the edge issuing instructions. That's right. Um, rescuers are very good with loud hailers. They can shout out right across the river and tell someone what to do. Um, not much use if you're not in the water yourself. I, I remember once um, I was driving and somebody, my supervisor, was acting as a backseat driver. And I was a little irritated at that time. I was just enjoying my drive and somebody tells me, go. Oh, Speed up here, speed up there. <laughs> I'm like, how can we just enjoy this ride? So I decided to take my supervisor off the freeway and into a much longer scenic route <laughs> to our destination. So I think sometimes we do have that control freak in us. We want to get to a place quickly and solve a problem. Do you find mm. that that's the case? Mm. Absolutely. I think very often what a person is asking for is not to have their problem solved, but mm. they want someone with them. It feels lonely, it feels difficult, um, they're tired, just having someone who's there and is, is, is their supporter, uh, that's what they're really wanting. That's right, and sometimes changing views, changing the viewpoint, you know, instead of being on a fast freeway, going into... Yeah. The the little uh, villages and the side roads can be helpful. Yep. Mm. And then if along the way you stop in a cafe and have a cup of coffee together and chat about other things, then you're starting to strike up a different kind of relationship, which is a really nourishing one. That's right. You know, I teach a subject here called Buddhist Ethics that's coming up soon. And in this particular subject, we explore in what is really Buddhist ethics is different from other forms of ethics is the intentions behind the actions. So the intention. 
am I there to help because I want to show off that I'm a better person, I am able to help? Or am I there just as you say, just I want to walk this path together with you? Yes, absolutely. And um, human, you know, dogs, dogs know whether a person is well intentioned towards them. Mm. And in fact, I understand that if you want to know if someone is being honest, you look at their left eye, not their right eye. And apparently humans do this and dogs do this, but no other animals. Now, we know what people's intentions are. And if we don't trust them, we get a little bit anxious and a little bit toey, even if we're not conscious of it. If someone's intention is right, it doesn't matter if they stuff it up or make a mistake, you know, providing it's not a fatal mistake. Uh, particularly if they're able to say, oh, look, that wasn't very helpful. What, what else should we try and make it a shared, a shared issue? Wow. Um, um, but because what the intention shows is it shows what my heart wants to do in relation to your heart. Yes. That's really what it's about. Um, mm -hmm. And it's our hearts that are often hungrier than our brains for connection and support and relationship. It is so true. There are some comments that are coming in, Gavin. May I share one with you? Mm -hmm. There is a comment here to say that this person likes the analogy of the river. Pointless saying, what piece of water is different from the other? And um, he or she will try and remember this in the workplace. Mm. So yes, that's so true, isn't it? We, we tend to divide too much in this world. But that didn't used to be the case. We used to live communally. We used to be able to help one another in a village setting. But now we live in little apartments and we tend to just block ourselves out. And everyone else and in and instead reinstate our individuality the sense of self becomes so big yes and and, and um, there's that experience which is always surprising which is that when you give something away you've got more than when you're holding on to something and it's quite counterintuitive. So I'm in a meeting with people at work and I'm making my contributions and my contribution's really sharp and I want to make sure that everybody gets it. And I want to make sure everybody knows it's mine. And I spend the whole meeting kind of worrying about my contribution and making sure that I get the credit. I will leave that meeting far, feeling far emptier than if I've been in there and I've given the idea away and it's developed and other people have brought it back in another way and then I've joined in with what someone else has had and by the end of the meeting no one really knows what came from whom except yeah. it came from us and it's a matter of empirical truth and worth checking you actually go away feeling better we we've trained ourselves to believe that the way to feel good is to have things that we hold on to and we believe it. Um, it's not true, but we need to find it's not true. And that's not a matter of reading books, and it's not a matter of telling ourselves in our minds. It's a matter of just trying it, see what happens. Do it in very small ways. Um, that's true. You're with someone, don't, 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 don't insist on your point, just let it go. Um, three minutes later, is the conversation better or worse? Hey, probably better. I think that's, that's so true. And the Buddha tells us in the Kalama Sutta, you just try it. So yeah. you don't have to take what we say, you just try it. And I think that's what we've done as a practicing Buddhist. Darwin, there's mm. a question here from a member of the audience. It, let me try to paraphrase this. It's about the isolation, about this depth of isolation. Is, it, is, is this depth of isolation too deep from a spiritual well-being point of view? So are we is this isolation really good for our spiritual well-being or not? My immediate response is not quite an answer to that. But I'm spending this time in a nice house, in a nice garden, with enough things to do, but also enough time for meditation and reading and thought. And I think it's terrific. 
Mm. And I'm inclined to spread that to other people mm. and to think, hey, it's probably the same for other people. There are all these opportunities. Maybe they could take them up. And I think the answer is I just don't know what it's like for anybody else. And I just don't know what's good for them, except people to whom I've talked and to, to whom I've listened. And um, quite a number of them have really benefited from it. But I'm aware that they live in the same bubble that I do, which is that our place in the world is still there. Um, that um, uh, the place that we're living in doesn't drive us crazy. Most of us have got access to a garden of some kind. And many of us do actually share our house with at least one other person. So I think the answer is, I have no idea. But it is a thing I think that one can explore for oneself with some kind of wisdom and sensitivity because there is no doubt there is a time when being on your own and being able to go quiet and to go within opens up worlds that you normally don't have contact with. And there are also times when what it does is it just brings out anxieties which get worse and worse and worse and I think like the Kalamata Sutta you're the judge and if you are finding that it's driving you inwards there's no point in telling yourself I'm supposed to be getting spiritual benefit out of this work out what you can do to deal with the anxiety which might be talking to people on the phone more and doing all kinds of external things um, on the other hand if you're finding that it's um, opening up new spaces then take the opportunity but but I think it's very easy for us to think we ought to be spiritual and make the most of it or we ought to whatever whatever and yeah. forget that just see what happens that's right I agree with you Valen I I think that in in our situation today Sometimes we have no control of the environment. If we are put into compassionate isolation, well, let's make the best use of it. There's no point kicking and screaming against it. No. Something, I've, something I've learned from, I guess, my Chan practice is to learn to ride the waves, whatever the waves are. They may be high waves, low waves, dangerous waves, pleasant waves, whatever it is, we make the best use of the moment. I, I look at um, Venerable Master Shing Yun, the founder of Nantian Institute. He's been, so, he's been through so much trouble, death-threatening experiences, but yet it didn't stop him with his, with his vow in life, and that is to bring goodness to the world. I think if we mm. know what our original intentions are, and that is to do the best we can, to bring out the best of humanity, whatever the situation, that would be helpful, I think. There are a few more questions here. Can, can I just say yes. one more thing on that? Um, it seems to me there's two things. One is to trust and listen to your experience, mm. which is not always easy. The second one is it's really helpful if you can find something which grounds you, which might be some music, uh, might be reading the papers, might be going for a walk, who knows what it is, but something that you know when you're starting to feel a little bit off balance mm. and you're not feeling like a good surfer yet, so you actually want a bit of help, uh, you can go to that thing which you know is going to help you. And even if you're in isolation, it may be going for a walk and nodding at someone on the other side of the street. Mm. But just the more you're aware of those things which ground you and give you strength, then you can come back to your own experience and say, yep, I can see what's going on here. Mm. Okay. We've got a several comments from mm -hmm. our participants who said that they agree with um, what we've been talking about, especially there are some who agree with you that they really enjoyed the isolation period and, and, and acutely aware that um, he or she has uh, good conditions but many people do not have this benefit and isolation for them is really adding to their struggles. Mm. And um, there is also somebody who comments that was comforting to think that we are all in this together. The fact is that our situations are not quite the same. Some have lost jobs, face grave threats, 
and also a lot of fears. Some face more than others. And how does one to cope with this deep inequality? What do you think, Byron? Well, you can say in a very smug way, we're all in this together because mm. we're all threatened by the COVID virus and smile and go about our way. And that's certainly not truly being in it together. And that certainly there's no sense of solidarity there. It seems to me, I am in a better place if I am at least concerned about the extra problems that other people have because of their circumstances. If I just go about and say, oh, it's fine, I'm having a good time, but ah, but ah, without being aware of the extra suffering that some people have because of losing their jobs or they're in a difficult relationship and they're cooped up together and whatever it might be, uh, to, to, to really have a, a sense of the reality of that mm. and therefore some sense of compassion for those people I think is, is really helpful. The other thing that I think is quite helpful at the moment is that a lot of us are thinking about how we would like the world to be when it comes out, when we come out of this. And um, I think it's going to be a really important time in charting the direction of our country for the next five years. So getting clear about the things that we care about that matter. And for me, for example, that includes proper non-punitive support for people who are not able to make a living in the conventional ways. It's just really, really, really important. And part of my commitment is to do whatever I can to support moves that will take things in that direction. So I do think there is a, a practical um, forming of intentions towards the future, which if enough of us do, it will start to um, colour public opinion and public responses. And I think that's actually a responsibility for all of us, is to think, what have we learned about ourselves and the world through this? And what are we determined will not stay the same? Doesn't mean we can fix it, doesn't mean we're in a position to fix it. But if we know what matters, and we have an idea of the sort of direction it might go in, then I think we are, in a sense, doing some important work on behalf of everybody, not just on behalf of ourselves. It's so true, Gavin. I, I, I feel very sorry for many people who are suffering during this period, especially those who have, as a result of the pandemic, have lost their jobs. The skills are no longer able to cope with the new normal anymore. And somehow I think we'll have to find a way for us to help one another through this. There are many dimensions. I think that's one of the things we do in Buddhist Council and that's why we try to call all the Buddhist communities and find out um, if there's anything we can do for the Buddhist communities, if there's um, how we can help one another and we're forming such networks. Then there are times when people will just have to learn new skills, for example, for new jobs that will be coming up. And also that um, we'll have to be able to reflect back to the government, to the politicians about what's needed. So all about these causes and conditions. So maybe this segues into our third segment, which is how you've mentioned that in order for us to reach out and help others, we should also have a strong sense of ourselves and are having a secure base or foundation. This has mm. often been translated to you must help yourself before you can help others. So how can we as individuals strengthen our base so that we can confidently and effectively help others, especially those of us, I guess, whose base at the moment, we're feeling much less confident because we're hit so badly by the consequence of the pandemic. So um, just starting with that phrase, help ourselves before we help others. I understand the intention. It can suggest that we put other people off, fix ourselves up, and then we, and then we can go out to the world. The phrase that works better for me is make sure we're okay. 
So before I go to help someone else, or before I go out to be active or whatever, I just need to make sure I'm okay. A couple of reasons for that. One is, if I'm not okay, then I'm not going to be able to go very far before I start to feel anxious and out of my depth. The other is if I'm not feeling okay, then I'm likely to take some of my needs, which I haven't really recognized, and try and sort them out in my help or support or activism or community work or whatever it is. And while there's nothing wrong with that, if you don't know you're doing it, then it can get in the way. Mm -hmm. So I think the first thing, it's like a little, it, it's more like a pre-flight check on a plane um, than anything else. It's just make sure the systems are all okay. And in particular, one of the systems that's really helpful is if I feel a bit anxious, what can I move back to? And I'll give you a very specific sort of illustration of how I've tried to make sure I'm okay. So in taking on the role as chair of the Buddhist council, some areas I'm quite unconfident about. So what I've done is I've organized that there's a, a wise older Buddhist whom I meet with about every four weeks and I just talk about what I'm doing. The knowledge that I'm going to be meeting with him gives me profound reassurance that if I start to go off track a bit or, or whatever, it's gonna get picked up when, when I meet and we talk about it. So I've, I've, I've just made provision for myself that it's going to be okay. And the equivalent for someone else might be that you're going to go out and help with this or that or the other. And when you get back, get back home, you'll ring a friend and talk about it. And you know you're going to do that. So even if you get come back home feeling a bit uncertain about what you've done or whatever, you know that that's going to be attended to quickly because you're going to ring Mary or Joe or Jeff and uh, you're going to be able to sort that through. And the, we all have different sources for feeling secure in ourselves and we also all have different um, depths of that sense of security. For some of us it's quite deep and there's not much will shake us. For other people, they're more tentative in the world and it's more difficult. I think what's really important to recognize is that there's absolutely no value judgment on that. That what is really helpful is people working within their sphere of safety with other people. And actually, when you meet the outer edge of your sphere of safety, that's when you grow yourself. That's when you learn something yourself. You don't learn something by useful by doing what you've done every day for the last 30 years and you're really good at. You learn by doing something a bit new and a bit different. And for those of us for whom that sense of, am I out of my depth, comes a little bit sooner, one of the reflections is, I think, that that's actually the point where we can learn and grow from the experience ourselves. And then next time we can go another foot and then another foot and then another foot. So in terms of working on and with ourselves, um, the benefit comes very quickly. Yeah, this is like building resilience. The more difficult the circumstances are, the more we'll have to be resilient. Recently, yeah. I was walking around the grounds of um, Nantian because we're now close to the public. The butterflies came back. And mm -hmm. the wild flowers are so beautiful. They grow and grow because I guess there was rain and the conditions were right. But they managed to grow through all these difficulties. And, and you notice we perhaps use this opportunity to grow, but sometimes we feel helpless. And I believe mm -hmm. that's the time when we turn to the community. Yes. The community could be our friends and family, but it also could be the community, the Buddhist community that we used to go to, people whom we can confide in. Um, like for yourself, you, you go to this um, wise old Buddhist who will be able to assure you about what your next steps are. I try to build up a think tank to help me to say what will higher education in the next um, era look like? When we reopen our doors, how is Nantian Institute going to face a new world? So the need to turn around and I think ask for help as well, the ability to open up and ask for help. I think that is so important. People who can't 
ask for and receive help mm. can't give it mm. they can help people fix things but the kind of heart to heart help the we're in this together help is mm. only possible if it's working both ways mm. notion of mutuality and in some ways asking for help for many of us is much harder than giving help because it's opening our vulnerability it's saying I'm just finding this really hard and I don't know what to do. And if we're wise, we'll be very discriminating about where we go for help because we want to be helped. We don't want to be rescued or whatever else might be there. But that ability to open up again to someone else or to a group of people can be absolutely transformative because the thing around which you built this shell, around which you built the barrier, once that's dissolved, then again, you get the flow happening. Then you're able to draw on the strength of other people and you're able to have the experience that other people are drawing on your strength too. And that is one of the nicest things, that sense, I've got very little, but it was helpful for someone else. You know, this whole thing about vulnerability that you raised just now was truly important. We are so used over the past, I guess, the past few years about bringing of, you know, sheltering ourselves, building a shell around ourselves so that we don't feel vulnerable. But one of the things that we do as monastics, for example, is I think learning to feel vulnerable by taking a vow of poverty, a, a vow of celibacy and all. But as a result, I think our worlds open up. You know, we're used, now we're used to a simple life. So not having um, too many distractions to us is good. And we learn that from our communal practice, how to deal with simplicity, how to deal with lack, not mm. having. Mm. Perhaps that's something we could reflect upon, that maybe what we were used to have may not be necessary anymore. So, if you think that, I mean, you can think of lack as being, mm. I want to have things and I don't have them. But the other way of thinking about it is that our world and our mental space has mm. limited capacity. And the more we've got in it, the less room there is for anything new. Or, even more important, the less room there is for something to pass through it. And what can seem like lack, poverty, emptiness, mm. not having, can actually be a receptive space where new things, like the wildflowers in your, in your, in your grounds, mm. where they can spring up because there's now a bit of space for them. There aren't people wandering around all the time and trampling them down. So, um, and, and then that leads into if you're aware that there are open spaces then you can be very very interested in the question of well i wonder what's going to come i wonder what's going to arise um, and then you can become curious and you can become sensitive to smaller things that you wouldn't notice because you were concerned with all of these things that you've got and you're wanting to hold on to um, and some of them will grow into big trees and some of them will be beautiful flowers that last a day and you'll be very pleased you saw them Yes, there is a comment or question together coming here to say that we have lost that main essence of togetherness. People no longer feel they are part of any real communities anymore. People felt completely isolated way before the pandemic. And we need to make this loneliness of people a thing of the past and work on ways to bring people back in the feeling of being part of a community. So this oneness of society, so that's a uh, comment that came, I think that reinforced what you say. And between people too, there's a story which has always haunted me because I don't fully understand it. And it's about Albert Einstein and one of his students. And Einstein had set the student some particular very complicated mathematical problem to solve and the student came back next week and put his um, solution in front of Einstein. Mm -hmm. The way the story was told, all it said was they both suddenly realized what he had done mm. and I had no idea what it was. But what was very beautiful, Einstein was, I think, a very good violinist and this person was a very good pianist. Mm. 
what they did was as one, they got up and they went over to the piano. Einstein got his violin and they just played music. Ooh. Now, what is lovely there is that here you have a world famous physicist and you have one of his students the expectations of i set you a problem and have you been able to solve it and what can you learn from it something upset that and what was left was two people sitting together thinking wow but because they were very cultured people for want of a better term they were able to not just say wow they were able to get up and play some bach and that must have been one of that must have been a truly magic moment and i'm sure that's why the story has been handed down but what i love is I have no idea what einstein thought the student had done and it doesn't matter what it had done is it had blown away the expectations that's so cool and speaking of music perhaps it's a good time now for us to take a 30 second break allowing our participants to digest what they've heard and for us also to maybe just to regroup ourselves and I'd just like to invite everyone to sit back and relax and enjoy 30 seconds of music. And we'll come back after this for the questions and answer session. little pause, I hope, has been helpful. We now invite our um, audience members. If you would like to post any questions, to please feel free to post in our chat. And I have a few questions that have already come in, so let's take them one at a time. Would that be okay, Galen? Please. All right. What should my first intention be when I'm helping another? How do I avoid it coming across as having ulterior motives? Um, well, I suppose if you have ulterior motives, mm. it's probably best if they absolutely come across and people can see them. So in some ways, I think what is very important is to be quite transparent. Um, and ulterior motives doesn't mean wicked, dreadful motives. It just means I've got my mind on something else as well as what this person needs. And it's probably helpful for everyone to recognize that because then you can move on from it. If you're trying to uh, look as if you haven't got ulterior motives when you have, then you're stuffed. So that's one thing. Um, I think what you, I think the thing to do is to try and get a sense of the person and to understand where they're coming from without wanting to change it, without wanting to solve it, without wanting to fix it. For most of us, the sense that someone is concerned about us and where we're at and is taking the time to find out what we really want is incredibly rare. I mean, it's extraordinarily rare. Mm. You can go weeks without it, honestly, because people are always coming in because they know what's best and they're busy and there's all of this and, and anyway, something else. Mm. So the gift of, of someone who really listens to you, who says, I see your problem, but I see you. And I want to know about you. Um, so it's like um, Jouet's example of taking the back roads. And I said, yes, and if you stop for a coffee, that's even better. When you stop for a coffee, you're getting to know each other in a way which isn't which is outside this i want your help and i can you're going to help me stuff it's um it, it 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 from that point you can do anything yeah that's right thank you Garvin. another question came in for you when faced with various so-called problems and issues what do we prioritize is family first friends or colleagues I think there's two, there's two things to think about. One is the urgency of things in the real world. 
Mm -hmm. So if your colleague's about to commit suicide, I would suggest you focus on that one. Mm -hmm. um, if something really serious is happening in the family, I would go there. Mm. So there's that. But also I think, listen to your heart. Mm. See which one feels most immediate and that you're most tuned to. It's not as if you're going to put the others off for three weeks while you solve the other one. Um, <laughs> especially as if you think that attention to people is as important as anything else when you're trying to help them. You can still give attention to your colleague even though you're not spending a lot of time helping them with whatever it is. But I think if you go from where your heart tells you you are at the moment, you'll be much more effective and you will then be able to move on and help the others. And it's not as if, if you don't help them and fix things, nothing's going to happen. They're their problems, they're not your problems, or they're their difficulties. By the time you get back to your colleague, she may have solved it, she may be really happy with what you've done, and it's much better than what you would have suggested. So it may have been a very good thing that you were off helping your family or somebody else. So what I'm trying to get at is, you actually never know what's going to happen, and you never know what really matters out there, until you come to it. And... So the question of how you come to it beyond that first sort of triage of is this really serious or not, is probably what does my heart tell me? Where do I feel most able to help? I think, Garvin, you and I have a, I guess, a meditation practice. And that meditation practice helps us to access our heart and mm -hmm. access our intentions and knowing um, where our starting point is and where I am. How anchored am I when I move forward on anything? So if there's yes. one thing I'd like to recommend to everyone out there is to also start a meditation practice, especially during this compassionate isolation period, because that helps to ground ourselves in, in a way that I, help us to see ourselves in a better way. I, I know that for many occasions, I've always wanted to jump in and help because that's that, that I guess that little streak in me to say, hey, let me help now. Let me try to do this. Let me try to fix the problem. I'm a problem fixer. But I've also learned through experience that if I just step back a little bit and pause and just watch the conditions a bit more to fully appreciate where the person comes from or to just find out more from people around and then... Um, Learn to say, I guess, more compassionate words when we approach the situation that may be more helpful. There's a, a, a little comment in a book by a psychoanalyst whose name I've forgotten, but it always stayed me. And when I was working with a counsellor, I found it very useful. He said that when people come for professional help to a counsellor or a therapist, they always have a problem in their hand and they put the problem in front of the therapist and they work on it together. And that's never, ever, ever the real issue. That's their bus ticket to get there. That's their ticket to get through the door, to be taken seriously. Mm. The most important thing is what, and, and, and you have to respond to it because that's what they've put to you. But what you have to be doing is trying to work out what's really going on here. Why have they really come to see me? Right. And that's a slow and patient thing. And, and fixing just gets in the way. Um, yes. Yeah. I've learned that. I've learned that too. So there's another question here, Garmin, that says, when someone comes to me with a problem, when is it okay to talk about myself and my experiences? Is relating my own experience helpful? Look, absolutely it can be, because that's what you're working with, and relating it is opening to the person and being honest. I think there's um, some things to watch out for and some things where it's really helpful. Where I think a thing to watch out for is assuming that your experience is directly relevant to their situation. Mm -hmm. It may not be. So you need to check that out because if you recount an experience which is a bit off center, they may think, oh, this proves this person hasn't heard me. So checking out is really important. But the other thing is you can talk about, suppose I want to make a suggestion to someone. I can say, you ought to do this. Or I can say, you might do this. Yeah. Or I can say, when I had a situation like this last week, what I did was, mm. I'm bringing my own experience in a way which it softens. I'm not telling anyone what to do. 
it's right. kind of sharing an experience which they can pick up if they want. Yes, yes. Whereas with the other approaches, they have to take it or they have to say no thanks. Um, so that opening up of one's own experience can actually increase the agency and autonomy of the person that you're helping. Correct. And then I think this leads to um, another question that we have here. It says, how does karma or causes and conditions interrelate with helping? Well, I think there's a couple of things. There's no doubt, I mean, whatever your understanding of karma is, there is no doubt that how we have behaved and what we've experienced in the past helps condition how we respond in the present. So if I've had a lousy childhood, I'm going to find it harder to trust people, whatever it may be. So I think there is, as it were, an ongoing preparation for helping, which is learning to be crudely a good person because that actually leaves you in a position to respond in a wholesome way. But the other thing is that whatever happens, if you think about that it does arise from causes and conditions, you know, it's no accident that, mm -hmm. then it helps you actually understand the situation because helping is partly about this business of intention and sharing and being in it together. The other part of helping is actually being smart mm -hmm. and saying, get it and what you haven't factored in is that xyz hmm. um, so understanding causes and conditions and helping people understand them can help them just understand a bit better what the what is actually the cause of the difficulty and therefore where they might put their mm -hmm. efforts That's right. um, mm. and it's about being skillful and perhaps that also explains why people think there's inequality, the causes and conditions of the past have led to where we are now. But that's not deterministic in a sense that we can change those causes and conditions. We are empowered to change those causes and conditions for a better future. And even when we feel very helpless ourselves now, we have a community. So reach out to that community. Gavin, yes. we have only three minutes left. Do you have a final message for our audience? A, th a couple of things. One is, this is the business of being human. And being human is messy and difficult, but it's a thing we do together with six or seven or eight billion other people on the planet. We don't do it on our own. So this sense of solidarity is very much a part of recognizing being human. When we help people, we bump into the difficulties that we create for ourselves, the judgments that we make against other people, uh, the reasons that we invent for society not helping people, us not being concerned with particular groups of people, whatever it is. Um, and when we bump into those, um, we can do two things. We can say, oh yes, no, no, that's a, a recent migrant I don't have to care about them or whatever it is. Or we can take it as an opportunity to think, hang on a sec, here's someone in real difficulty and I'm saying because of X, they shouldn't be helped or I won't help them. What's going on? And I think a lot of us are feeling this about the lack of support for um, uh, asylum seekers and for overseas students at the moment and seeing there's something badly awry about our collective Australian sense of humanity and understanding that I need to do something myself in order to make sure I'm not caught up in that. So there's something about this helping that's at the human heart of orienting ourselves to the world in a way that is helpful, has solidarity, um, and is ultimately rewarding because it does leave us recognizing, not just feeling, but recognizing that we are interdependent. None of us has all the questions. None of us has all the answers, but together we can make a much better fist of it. Thank you so much, Gawain, for those beautiful words. It is very, I think it comes from 
your experience, I think we can feel it comes from the bottom of your heart. Darwin and I may not have answers to all your questions, but I must say that we are here to share. We mm -hmm. thank you very much for your patience, your comments, just beautiful comments, and those very thoughtful questions to us. Don't you think those those questions are difficult questions. They are the messy business of being human that we have to deal with. And that's life. Humanistic Buddhism is life. It's everyday dharma for everybody. So if you are interested to hear more from Gawain about this topic of um, helping from home, please come to our Nantian Institute's Humanistic Buddhism Center and your HBC SoundCloud site. You will hear Gawain's full podcast. And soon we will also be putting this webinar online in the same podcast platform so you can listen back again to some of the things that we have heard. We hope that you have found some gems of knowledge that's useful to you while experiencing this particular pandemic and appreciate the values that actually we as human beings already intrinsically possess. Here at the Nantian Institute, we provide a few subjects that may be able to help you put these best practices um, into some kind of a form in a more academic environment that cuts across all traditions with some assured quality that helps you to maybe recalibrate and bring those questions in to build that community. And in this community here at Nantian, we hope that will give you some answers. So we look forward to seeing you at our next webinar episode, Maintaining a Steady Mind with Buddhist lawyer, Tina Ng, who is also on the uh, Buddhist Council together with Gawain and me. And finally, I'd like now to invite you to check out with a dedication of merit. Let us now dedicate the goodness of what you have done to all living beings. May kindness, compassion, joy and equanimity pervade all worlds. May we cherish and build affinities to benefit all beings. May Chan, Pure Land and Precepts inspire equality and patience. May our gratitude and humility give rise to great vows. Thank you very much, Gawain, and thank you to our listeners online. We hope that you, your family, your friends, and all beings can remain safe and well during this period. We look forward to seeing you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thank you.